Okay, so our study is impossible. Um, knowing that with God, all things are possible. And um, tonight is impossible peace with Lynn. And then next week will be impossible surrender with Gretchen. And we actually talked a little bit about surrender in my lesson on impossible faith, um, June 22nd, which was pre-recorded, um, which was really weird, but I got through it. Um, so anyway, if you want to see a little bit about surrender there, um, as going into next week, um, you could do that. Okay, Lynn, if you want to go ahead and pray and everybody make sure you're muted and then we'll sing as soon as Lynn is finished praying. Dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can get together as women and sisters in Christ and help us to be an encouragement to one another and to um, just learn more about you and draw closer to you. Father, we do pray for Shelva. We pray that her uh, surgery can get scheduled so that she can have some relief from her pain. We pray for Donna Williams' brother and his continuing treatments and pray that they go well and that he can keep his strength. And we pray for Rick uh, Reynolds to Father. We pray that this will work and that um, he'll be able to have the endurance to get through this and just give him strength and uh, give him uh, courage and uh, positivity. Father, we pray for baby Esther. We thank you that she is continuing to do well. Uh, we pray that the infection is long gone and, and uh, praise you that she's gaining weight. We pray for Jeff and Cindy York and for Mrs. Justice as they weather this real storm that is heading their way and um, keep them safe and, and, and the people, all the people in the path of that storm, keep them safe and the damage minimal, um, help them to, to do what they can to, um, to take care of that. Father, we pray for um, Brenda Connor um, and the ongoing things that she's asked us to pray for. Um, we know that you know the situation and that you are working in their lives. And Father, we pray for Betsy Gooch, um, pray for healing for her and that, um, They'll be able to cure her cancer too and give her strength to get through the treatments. Father, bless us this next hour and, and this week as we try to glorify you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Um, all right. So I was thinking, actually, we should have done Master the Tempest is Raging uh, because that's our first story. But anyway, welcome to tonight's thing, uh, lesson about peace. I know we had a lesson on peace in the aroma, uh, the aroma of peace in Cassandra Martin's study from last quarter. And she had made the comment there that it was uh, kind of a reconciliation with God is where you get peace and that peace was, you know, being at one with God. Um, and I was curious about that. And so I did look up peace from this passage um, in Strong's. And this is what I found. Um, there's the Greek word pronounced irene, no, irene. And it's um, probably from a primitive, the primary verb um, to join. And um, so there's that at one concept. And then uh, it means peace, literally or figuratively, and by implication, prosperity. And so it's being at one or at peace, having quietness or rest set at one again. So I could get what she was saying and I uh, um, appreciated that. And I wanted us to think about that as we look at the four lessons from Luke 8 tonight that we're looking at. Um, the first one is Jesus calms the storm. It's a, that's why I said we should have sung Master, the Tempest is Raging. Um, but we're going to look at uh, the passage first. It's from Luke 8, 22 through 25. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid. And they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him. Uh, she, Martin talks about the weather patterns in the Sea of Galilee, and that it is, the Sea of Galilee is like in, sitting in a bowl surrounded by a bunch of hills. Um, Jennifer has been there, so she could, you know, tell us about that. But um, anyway, the weather patterns there because of that are unpredictable, and it can be seemingly calm at one moment, and the next time it can be pretty treacherous weather. Um, and I, I think it's always interesting with this story because these, some of those disciples, as we know, were experienced fishermen. They knew about steering boats through storms. But, so that kind of speaks of the gravity of this storm and uh, the fact that they were so afraid and thought that they were perishing. Um, Martin talks about, well, they, they think they're perishing, so they wake up Jesus. And uh, Martin talks about the root of their impossible. Um, hold on a minute here, sorry. The next slide, there we go. Um, we panic because we focus on the power of the waves and our, on our own ability to change our circumstances. God calls us to fix our eyes on the might of our savior and his power to transform us in the midst of our circumstances. Um, they were not focused on the right thing. They were, you know, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Um, and sometimes, Martin makes the point that sometimes we do that too. We sometimes question whether or not God actually cares about us in this particular situation. Um, instead of fixing our eyes on what he's doing or what he can do, um, we have our focus on the problem that we're dealing with. Uh, she says that the disciples, and it's probably true, the disciples didn't expect him to do a miracle, but they wanted to know that he was at least panicking with them or helping to bail um, the water out of the boat. Um, and so she points out that we need to remember not to panic and to realize that God doesn't panic. Um, she says, God does not panic 
because God has a different perspective. Did you have any thoughts on that? I thought that was an interesting thing. God does not panic because God has a different perspective. Anybody, any comments about that? I wish I had that perspective. You know, I think that's part of the transformation is getting that perspective. Um, but his perspective, of course, he knows the outcome. He knows, and he knows what's most important. Um, and we get focused on what's not as important, I think. Um, anyway, must my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, we see, and, go ahead. And nothing takes God by surprise. Right. <laughs> Yeah, we see our small little segment of time and he, you know, sees beyond the existence of time. And um, yeah, Gretchen's right. He doesn't, nothing surprises God. And I, um, I find great comfort in that. And uh, well, yeah, when we're going through a very tough time, we, we do have to deal with what's going on, but that's where our faith comes in to try to try to to know that God um, is there, you know, and that's, well, that's the piece that we're going to talk about, you know, that we have in spite of the trouble, you know, but, but like Jennifer said, we, we don't have that perspective, but we strive to, to, um, you know, to gain it somehow, you know, through, through our faith. Right. Absolutely. Um, going back to my notes here. Um, yes. And then Luke says that Jesus rebuked the storm and Mark quotes him as saying, peace be still. And I kind of like that peace be still, because that goes back to that whole definition of peace and the being at rest and the quietness. Um, but then Jesus rebukes the, the disciples because of their lack of faith. Um, and he says, where is your faith? And so in the middle of the storm, they had forgotten to rely on um, Jesus, to rely on God's faithfulness. And it brought to mind this um, book I, I've read, Pat Scott, can you see it? Pat Scott, I think, came and spoke to our congregation, um, or to the women, of course, years ago, because this is autographed by her. But this book, Batten Down the Hatches, um, talks about this whole thing of preparing your faith or, or building your faith before you hit these major storms in life. Um, because obviously going through storms builds our faith, but you, you know, sometimes you have to have a lot of faith to go through whatever storm it is. In her case, it was the murder of her husband, which she witnessed. But she was talking about how the, the only way she had gotten through that was her faith in God. And um, when you're in the midst of a storm, yes, your faith can increase. But if you don't have a foundation of faith to start with, it's more difficult. And so these, the disciples needed to focus on God and his faithfulness. And we need to focus on God and his faithfulness and realize that, you know, his perspective. Um. And I, I, Martin does point out, and this is an excellent, excellent point. Sometimes the storm is totally calmed for us when we pray and have faith. And sometimes we go through the storm, but God sees us through it. Um, either way, it's God working in our lives that gets us through the situation. Um, and we need to rely on God for that. Was somebody starting to say something? This is where this is different from teaching a class in person. I can't, you know, I just hear sounds and sometimes I wonder. Anyway, um, God can, can calm can, can, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can, um, uh, no, you know, go ahead. You, were, you were just talking about how when you go through a storm and you, you know, if you don't have the faith, uh, if you don't have that um, foundation, then it's, you know, harder to get through. And I, you know, I can see that, uh, you know, I had cancer 10 years ago 
And during that time, my faith increased tremendously um, because I totally relied on God and other Christians to get me through. And then several years later, I went through another big storm, but I can see how having cancer and going through all that really <laughs> prepared me for the next storm, you know, mm -hmm. because of, yeah, the tremendous faith that I incurred through the cancer, if that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> It makes it makes sense. Uh, I, yes, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, and I think you've done remarkably well. I know you have moments, but you've done remarkably well. <laughs> so, um, only with God's yes. strength. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, yes, and so that you're 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 making the point that Martin makes. God can calm our storms. And he can calm the storms that we have in our souls, which he's done for you. So moving on to the next story um, in Luke, God, um, this is Jesus heals the demon possessed man. Um, after calming a physical storm, Jesus is going to heal a man experiencing his own violent storm. And this is a long passage, so I didn't type it all out but um, Gretchen's going to read it for us. It's Luke 8, 26 through 39. So if you're a visual person like I am, you can open your Bible, but otherwise you can listen to Gretchen. Thank you, Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at, his, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked them, ask him to depart them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Thank you. So um, Gadara, the land of the Gadarenes, was one of the cities of the Decapolis, which um, is 10 cities. And they're largely Gentile cities, or they were then. Um, so hence you have pig herdsmen. Uh, these were you know, Jewish people don't keep herds of pigs. Um, and so I don't know if the demon-possessed man was Jewish and had gone over there, but I don't think so because Jesus tells him to go home and he goes about the Decapolis telling um, people what Jesus had done for him, which I think it's interesting. Um, we don't usually really think, or at least I didn't, or don't usually think of Jesus doing um, his ministry with Gentiles, but this one is clearly there is an impact on the Gentiles of that day. And of course, the Samaritans... Um, 
Jesus reached out to them as well. This was a, a poor man living in an impossible situation. Um, Mark's description adds a little bit more to it. Um, Mark 5, 3 through 5. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. Not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Um, he was truly desperate. He had no home, he had no dignity, he had no hope. Um, and it was an impossible life. And I, you know, it's interesting that Jesus went there. I think Jesus, I'm guessing, went there to heal this man. Um, Martin says that, you know, we kind of recoil from thinking about a demon-possessed man, but that we should have a, a good look at him um, because this man was a slave to sin or a slave to demons, and uh, we can become slaves to sin, which is just as horrific. Um, John 8, 34 says, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Um, and so we need to realize that, um, you know, our sin, if we let it get out of control, we become a slave to it rather than a slave or a servant of Jesus's, a daughter of Jesus's. Um, sin starts out a little bit, a little greed, a little um, pride, whatever it is. Um, and then it grabs hold of our lives. And this is Martin's description of it. That this sin is an impossible that we can understand. Many of us wrestle with a secret habit, a quiet sin or a hidden desire that drives our actions, controls our thoughts and defines our lives. We have tried to stop. Nothing works. We give in and eventually give up. It is so big, so controlling, so much a part of who we are that it becomes impossible. Um, so as we continue thinking about that, you know, um, looking at this story, I'm going to go on with it, but, um, you know, you can see the parallels that this can have. Jesus asked this man's name and he says, Legion, um, a legion is a major unit of the Roman army consisting of 3000 to 6000 infantry troops and 100 to 200 cavalry troops. This is a big problem. So if this man has legion uh, demons, it's a big problem. And um, Martin uh, was talking about how the, the problem is revealed in the light of Jesus's holiness and his sovereignty and that we need to reveal our sin in the light of that as well because um, then that way um, we, God can help us deal with it. Jesus was big enough for that very big problem. Um, so, and he sends the demons into that herd of pigs um, and the man is instantly saved from his impossible. And, and that's the whole point. It's impossible with us, it's possible with God. But our sin has to be revealed in the presence of Jesus like this demon possessed man's did. Um, Martin states, Jesus can't break the hold of an impossible that we won't acknowledge is an impossible. Um, and she, one of the verses used to uh, back that up is James 5, 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So as we're confessing sins, we're bringing them to light um, and then we can uh, work through them with God's help and they become, it becomes possible to deal with them. Any comments? I'm not moving off this story just yet, but do you have any other comments about that? Okay. The townspeople come back 
they hear from the herdsman what has happened and they come back and find this man in his right mind, um, wearing clothing again, cleaned up. And they react with fear and they ask Jesus to leave the area. And I just find that the saddest thing. Um, and, but I know that it's true. Sometimes people are too afraid to, um, to come to Jesus or to uh, give over our cares or concerns or our sins or our storms we're going through um, to Jesus. Can you, I don't know if you can think of examples of that or not, but I can in my own life, but I also, um, somebody that through the years I've talked to quite a bit, um, I haven't talked to enough people about my faith, but I have talked to her about my faith. And I feel like her um, heritage, I guess, and her um, fear of offending her family by leaving the Catholic Church might be a hindrance. I could be wrong, but that's, I, I feel like fear is part of the issue. I don't know. And I think it's really sad. Can you, I don't know, can you think of any other things like that? Okay, well, I guess I'm just saying we can't let our fear get in the way of letting God work in our lives. And we need to, again, remember his perspective and that he is bigger than any of our problems and um, things like that. But the good news is the man did go around to the Decapolis, and I don't know how many people heard about Jesus because of this man being he healed. Um, but there's a lot of potential there in 10 cities, and he had a lot to be thankful for, and he was thankful. So I think that's the good news. The next story is that Jesus heals the woman. Um, she has a physical storm. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She had an impossible situation. She was female, um, relying seemingly on her own money which was gone pretty much because of um, trying to find help from physicians and unsuccessfully and um, having this discharge for 12 years would have made her physically weak I'm guessing anemic and tired um, and as you probably know the mosaic law rendered her unclean therefore so she couldn't even really like hang around family. She couldn't have a relationship uh, with a man. Martin says if she was married, he probably um, divorced her. Um, at any rate, it made her an outcast in society. She couldn't worship anymore publicly. Um, and so this was an impossible situation. And I was thinking that 12 years of my um, 60 is one fifth of my life. Okay, and she was probably much younger. Uh, the average lifespan of a person was uh, 40 or so. And uh, he does call her daughter. Other times he calls people, you know, woman or whatever. Um, we'll talk more about the daughter thing in a minute, but you know, it, it, it could be that she was pretty young um, and she'd been dealing with that for, a, you know, it could have been a third to a half of her life which is very difficult and very horrible. She was suffering, I'm, sh suffering, I'm sure, spiritually, 
physically, emotionally. Um, and the situation made it difficult for her even to approach Jesus. She wasn't supposed to be out and about running into people in the crowds and um, touching Jesus, making him unclean in theory, Mosaic law and um, others around her unclean. So she couldn't just ask him. Um, but she has enough faith to know that if she touches him, she'll be healed. And it is enough faith and he does heal her. Um, she doesn't count on his knowing that she touched him, but of course he does. Of course, Jesus, this is Martin. Of course, Jesus knows it was the woman, but he's not done helping her face her impossible. She needs to know that he sees her. So I mentioned it before, but you know, do you notice that he called her daughter, which I thought was um, really cool because she went from being socially excluded to being included in Jesus's family with one word, daughter. It's a familial term. And I just think that's a, a really beautiful thing for her. And I'm sure she found it comforting. Um, she was recognized by Jesus. Uh, we are his daughters too. So we need to remember that God sees us even when we are feeling uncertain about that or feeling vulnerable. Martin says, we all have issues that make us feel invisible, vulnerable, or on the fringe. They can take any shape, form, or substance. What they have in common is the power to drain our hope, leach our peace, and cause leaks in our faith. In those moments, Jesus longs for your eyes to find his. You are not forgotten, alone, or unseen. The possible is just a touch away. How comforting is that? That Jesus sees us. He sees us personally. Martin asked the question, when do you most need to know that you're seen by God? And um, on page 87, um, I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. My first thought is in dire straits, we need to remember, um, but I can also see it when we're, we need to uh, know that we're seen by God when we're doing well um, so that we know we have gratitude that um, he's helping us spiritually um, and with blessing us with our, in our lives. Any comments about anything on that story? Okay. And the last one is Jesus raised a girl, raises a girl from the dead. Um, oh, I keep hitting the wrong button, sorry. Okay. And there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. And then, of course, you know, we have inserted there the healing of the woman story. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and the mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But she said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Um, another type of storm. We've had the, the regular storm, storm, weather storm. We've had a mental storm, mental, emotional, and we've had the physical storm. And this one is the death of a child, one's own child. Um, I've not thankfully had to deal with that um, I do know I was awfully scared when Elena ran, stuck her arm through the glass. Um, and that wasn't, you know, anything like this. Um, in this case, Jairus 
Jairus, how are we saying this? Jairus was not an outcast. He was a social, um, he was a leader in the community. He was a ruler of the synagogue, but he was still in an impossible situation. Um, so it's such an impossible situation that this ruler of the synagogue falls before Jesus and implores him to save his child. Um, he must have been awfully afraid. Um, he was probably panicking when Jesus stops to talk about the woman who had touched him. I, I can just, you know, come on, come on, let's go. Um, but he didn't seemingly stop Jesus or try to, I mean, pull Jesus along um, or try to. His servant came up to him right after that and told him not to bother Jesus anymore, that his daughter had died. Um, and I know, you know, she, Martin talks about, and I know we all struggle sometimes with God's timing um, because we're linear and we are bound by time. And this goes back again to God's perspective. Um, he doesn't, he created time with creating the earth, but he, you know, he is and he is before time and will be after time. But we live in the moment and, and Martin says, we live in this moment and want relief resolution and rejoicing right now. And I think most of us can relate to that. She also goes on to say that God's possibles always open up at exactly the right time, not for our comfort, but for his glory and good purpose. So it's, it's what is best for the kingdom, which always turns out to be best for us. Um, and so as we grow in our faith, we become more dependent on God and we become more humble and we learn to wait for God's timing. Um, but when he does hear that his daughter is ill or dead, Jesus reassures him and says, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. And then Jairus had that choice right then. Um, do I believe Jesus? Or do I believe my impossibles? And that's something that um, we can relate to. Martin says, impossibles tell us that if we can't figure out a solution, then no solution exists. But conversely to that, belief is the lens through which we can see that the possible is possible. So we have that same choice. Will I believe in what Jesus can do or will I walk away? So when Jesus tells them that the girl is only sleeping, the mourners laugh because they don't believe the possible. Fortunately, though, Jairus did, and the girl is saved. Anybody want to comment on this story? Okay, so what I did in this next slide is the heart messages that she has in her book. She didn't have one for the one story, but she did for the other three and I think these are things that um, we can think about and learn from these stories. And one, the one we already talked about, God does not panic because God has a different perspective. And then she mentioned, and we, um, in order to be free from our impossible, we must be willing to name it in the presence of Jesus. And waiting teaches us to be dependent be humble and be aware of the truth that God stands outside of our impossible time constraints. Um, does anybody else have anything of anything else that they got out of these stories? Um, the lessons that the stories offer that you've learned or you um, that occurred to you. On the second one about being free from our impossible and being uh, willing to name it. I think, um, I was I was holding back with something because um, because of fear and I didn't even realize it was fear like I didn't realize that was what was that was holding me back and um, once I recognized what it was then I was able to move forward does that make sense so yeah. I think that's that's I think that's what she's saying is we've got to be able to to know what it is, you know, what it is you're struggling, what your impossibility is and name it. 
and talk to God about it because we, we hide stuff from ourselves <laughs> too, you know, not even, yeah. not just other people. And we don't, I mean, we hide from other people. We hide from God. Um, but of course we can't, but we hide from ourselves an awful lot as, as well. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Naming our, um, impossible. I mean, yeah. Realizing that it is your, that it is fear in that case. I mean, it is very helpful. And, um, yeah, cause God obviously already always knows everything we're thinking, but, or feeling or whatever, but we need to be able to name it so that, yeah, we can let him work through us. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, um, you all saw Laura Rios posted, um, on the ladies page. Um, and I had never thought of this either but with this story with the demon possessed man, it really stood out to her how Jesus sent him back to his family because there would have been such shame and, and the family oh. probably would have been hidden and been fearful because of the, that connection to him. And, and, you know, obviously he was well known and that Jesus cared so much about his family also that he sent him back home so that they could see him restored and, and that would restore them then. Um, That's an excellent point. So yeah, I really thought that was really good. Great observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I sometimes I thought about that story and um, you know, why did, you know, cause he wants to go with Jesus and Jesus tells him no. And I, you know, sometimes think, oh, okay, that's Jesus's timing. But, um, and, and I, she point or the scripture points out that, you know, God or Jesus sends him to go back home. And, and I, Laura's point is excellent. And I also wonder about the other people hearing the, the message and hearing about Jesus because of it and the word of mouth that might, of someone they knew that might mean more than somebody that they'd never heard of talking about Jesus, if that makes any sense. Another thing. Uh, oh, go ahead. Testimony. <laughs> I mean, wow. What? I said, yeah, absolutely. I agree. And see what you're saying. He had such a testimony just immediately to be able to, yeah. you know, and everybody of course knew him and to see that transformation would have been powerful. Yeah. Well, when I used to teach at the Christian school, um, I taught, well, fifth, sixth, and seventh grades, but not all at the same time. It was two grades at a time, most of the time. But um, anyway, we always did a gospel in Bible class every year because I wanted them to know Jesus. And I, one of the things that I always empathize, emphasized when we did them, particularly the book of Luke, was signs of Jesus's authority. And this this chapter has four of them right there, and then they're, um, you know, I just think it's awesome to think about what he does. Um, Jesus has authority over nature. And he's able to stop a storm. Jesus has authority over demons. Jesus has authority over illnesses. And Jesus has authority over death in itself. All that in one half of a chapter of Luke. <laughs> but that's something else I get out of this. You know, just how awesome Jesus is. 